Chapter 9, The Die is Cast The Die is Cast A no-man straightened in his saddle, trying to stretch out his back. After another six days, he thought he would have again grown accustomed to the long day's riding. They were four abreast on that wide, straight road, Simon at his side and looking a little bored as he scanned the unbroken horizon. They had just passed the small town of Morpath, many of the local children coming to watch the procession pass, all bright banners and painted shields, some of the younger squires little older than them, the lads waving back and throwing out treats of the dried dates that were popular in those parts. Now, the scenery was returned to the rolling plains, the hot sun beating down on them. Tempered by a cool breeze and a no man was glad he had applied a bomb to his face that morning, he suspected any who hadn't would be tending a glowing sunburn by the evening. Next to him, tanned, tow-headed Simon sighed dramatically. Over a fortnight on the road now, and another five days before we reach the capital, I don't know that I will survive it. A no man tried not to smile. Simon you have been on campaigns much longer than this before. Indeed, but life is different as a squire, there is always something to be done, the idea that even your small errands are helping keep the battalion moving. Now, come the evenings, I just sit in my tent and listen to Codrell boring me stupid about how many ladies he's won and how many battle honors he has received. He glanced to him, at least you have a nicer sort of company to shorten the days. You are modest as ever, Simon. His friend snorted, his mordant laugh betrayed by the sparkle to his eyes. Ho ho, you know of whom I speak. It is usually Brianna here in my place. A no man shrugged, he had been wondering when this would raise its head again. And? We talk, that is all, would this be something of note were I behaving so with anyone else? No, but she is not anyone else, she is. It seems we are stopping, a no man interrupted, as the riders a few rows ahead of them pulled back on their reins, their pair following suit just as Eric rode into view, the man riding back from the head along their column, a fellow knight on the other side of the road and giving the same order. Halt, everyone, full halt. Simon raised himself in his saddle. Here, Eric, what is the delay? The paladin noticed them, slowing his horse from its trot to offer briskly, A messenger has arrived from the silver chalice, he's speaking with Sir Elquist now. Eric rode on, his voice and his orders fading away behind them, replaced by the low murmur of the men and slowly it filtered back through their ranks. They would not reach Dar Omar now. The order of the Silver Chalice would meet them two days hence outside the walled city of Saradush, the city of a hundred spires was under siege. Solafane trudged along, the rain beating a constant rhythm against the drooping brim of his hat, the sky above so dark, he hardly would have bothered wearing it had it not been for the weather. It had been a fortnight now since they had left the Star Spires, the way becoming warmer as they had traveled south, though that morning had donned a cool gray, the storm breaking just as they had set out and, after an entire day, even the elves were looking a little tired of it. Despite the weather, this journey had been bearable enough so far, though he did not much like the comments he received from some of his company, nor the looks he seemed to glean from all but Tandith and Avalar. Centuries of animosity bred a distrust that could not just be dismissed, however much some of the elves may have wanted to, and Solafane had the suspicion he could expect much of the same from the majority of surfacers, though their recent travels in the wilds had afforded him no opportunity to confirm this. His happiest times were those moments when he and Fritha would find themselves together, alone in some task or walking at the back of their group distant enough from the others that he felt he could relax as she would tell him the of the trees and birds and even the differing types of cloud that hung above. The girl would sing, too, sometimes, just to herself, 
though it pleased him. She felt comfortable enough to do so in his presence, even the silences were agreeable when they were shared, each day, or night, of walking drawing to a close to find them laid side by side in the cool of their tent, talking about the events of the day or anything else they pleased. If only they had been traveling at night they may have avoided these rains, but the broad river Agis was in their path, the banks too wide to ford and Fernil had reluctantly led their band back to the roads to take the local ferry across, the map Fritha had bought in Redm's store well worth the coin she had paid. The girl herself was ahead of him now, looking weary beneath her sodden hood, stray hairs plastered at her temples in a delicate filigree. They had disembarked the ferry half a league back their group still traveling the road from the river, the wide-packed gravel path raised up from the floodplain, steep banks of long grass falling away on either side, the surrounding land a patchwork of fields, Ferdinand unwilling to draw any more attention to their presence by tramping through the locals' crops, the mountains that were now but a day or so away looming on the southern horizon, the smoking peaks adding to the boiling gray. Clouds above. Hold, said Jastrin suddenly. There is someone up ahead. There were two people, in fact, a good few yards down the road behind that veil of rain, one lane out on the path, while the other crouched over them, the elves about him drawing to a wary halt. In the underdark, no one would even bother with such a ruse, any foolish enough to come to help merely marked themselves as an easy prey. But such was not the case there. What is it? asked Bryn, pushing through to the front, oh, should we not see if they require aid? Avalar sighed. Yes, child, we likely should. For a moment, no one moved. I'll go, offered Fritha, it's likely nothing. Solophane tensed, wanting to offer to attend with her though he knew his presence would likely only startle them were they injured, and he followed at a distance, relying on his hat and the veil of rain to raise doubt as to his race. The crouched man glanced up as she approached, straightening as he saw them. Ho oh there, please, my friend has been injured. Fritha quickened her pace, dropping to his side. What has happened? Her answer came in a knife's flash, the man stood at her back making to grab her. Fritha shrieked, dancing to the side with an agility that would have impressed any drow, the knife the man held knocked away by her forearm, his ally on the ground momentarily incapacitated as Fritha's foot caught him neatly in the groin. Tandith had already let an arrow fly, the flight humming through the wet air to thud solidly into the man's back. Solophane arriving at Fritha's side as the roar went up around them, men charging up from the grassy banks on either side. Ferdinil was barking orders in Elven, the sound almost lost in the shouts of the enemy. Disperse now. Tandith and Vestal, fall back and cover the group. Gerat, take out the bowmen. Frank and Job, get on the girl and that bloke in the hat. A scream from Vestal as Gerat's arrow whipped up the bank to miss Tandith and strike the elf behind him in the stomach, the elves before them scattering as commanded and rushing up to meet their enemies, while Solophane and Fritha were left to face but two men. A mistake really, Solophane had already killed his opponent, Fritha leaving him to the second as she bounded down the bank to kill the archer still crouched there, the next arrow Gerat had knocked lost to the sky as she piled into his side and ran him through. The elves were pressing the fight in three trios, flowing forward in harmonious melee and quickly overwhelming the weaker opponents in an effort to even the numbers, though some of the heavily armored men were proving more difficult to subdue. Jastrin ducked an axis sweep, Fernil cutting the man down as he moved to defend himself from young Bryn's blade, Jastrin already turned to set to the next, and he faltered back a step as he was checked by the towering warrior who had appeared behind him. Jastrin moved to dodge past him, giving a moment for his allies to join the skirmish, when another merc arrived, pressing him in, and his wife watched helpless from her own battle as he was slashed across stomach, Jastrin's scream a rally cry for the previously flailing humans. But the scream had rallied others, too, 
Bryn racing forward to catch the blow meant to finish the elf, Fernil but a pace behind and forcing the two mercs back to back as the warrior defended against the two elves. Bryn was little match for the fight he was in though, the warrior he fought ahead above him and well armed, raining blows from his heavy mace and it was clearly taking all the lad's strength to deflect them, a particularly powerful sweep sending Bryn staggering back, the man pressing forward to finish the elf, his back finally exposed, Fritha tearing up the bank behind him to slip her blade under his cuirass. Solifane fainted left and brought his blade back in a hasty slash, cutting his own opponent down and not waiting to see him die and he leapt over his body and raced to join Fir Nil. Frithi and Bryn moving to the fight behind them, allowing Avalar and Vesela to duck out and fetch Jastrin's collapsed form. Solafane danced past the desperate sweep to his face, the warrior could sense his end upon him, the drow forcing the man to step back to avoid his own blade and straight into Ferdinal's swing, the elves regrouping warily as the last human fell dead. The drow sheathed his blade, heart rattling in that familiar rush of battle, though the scene about him felt strange a sense of surrealism creeping in as he cast about them, the once empty path through the serene, rolling farmland now strewn with bodies, the gravel washed with a fine film of blood. He shook himself, pushing these disturbances away and closing to Fritha's side. Are you hurt? No, just my arm, I think he only meant to take me captive, oh, Jastrin, she cried, the girl hurrying off to help Avalar tend the wounded. Solafane's attention whipping back to their one survivor, the man who had served as bait still laid on the path, groaning softly. Fernil was already standing over him, the drow stalking over to open negotiations with a boot to his ribs. Who are you? Why did you attack us? The man cried out, rolling on his side to groan, We're just mercs on our way to Saradush. We watched you crossing on the ferry. You looked well healed and we thought to part you from your gear. He shrieked as Ferdinand's foot struck him soundly in the back. Gold hungry filth. For that you have injured two of our own. The man coughed up a mix of blood and rainwater. And you've killed my whole group, elf bastard. I think we're even. Solafane felt cold fingers close about his dagger's hilt. You are wrong. Soul. But Fritha's cry came too late, the short spray of scarlet silencing both her and the man, Fernil wearing an expression as close to respect as the drow had ever seen directed at him. Fritha just looked sad. How are they? asked Fernil. Avalar looked grim, glancing back to where Vesela was bent over her husband's supine form. Shielding him from the rain, Tandeth winding a tight bandage about Vestal's stomach. Vestal is better than Jastrin, but neither are good. I have tended them here as best I can, but I need light and shelter if I am to do more. We should make camp. Fretted Bryn. Here. Snapped Orville, what if others come? Fritha was struggling to refold her map in the rains according to this, there's a small town to the east, Sira Uendi Agis. Perhaps we can find somewhere there to stay the night. Within a human settlement? cried Cephas, his disgust no less than if she had suggested they all bed down in a cesspit. They were the cause of these troubles. Fernil looked equally repulsed by the idea though a groan from Jastrin made the decision for him. Fine, we go. Orville and Bryn, take the lead. Tandeth. But, Captain. Be silent, Cephas, and fall in. It was an hour's walk to the town, though it took them almost two at their much reduced pace, Jastrin carried between Avalar and Vesela, Vestal leaning on the wood elf. Sira was just a group of buildings huddled within a tall wooden paling, the two guards at the gate straightening at their approach, spears lowered warily and Solafane hung back, surreptitiously removing his hat to draw up the hood of his cloak. Hold there, travelers, 
and speak your purpose. Ferdinil sent Fritha Iskowl, the girl taking a step forward into her new position as the voice of their band. If you please, I am Fritha. My friends and I have been attacked on our journey and we need somewhere to stay the night. The guards shared a look, one shaking his head to offer, I am sorry, but the gates of Sira are closed to all outsiders until this trouble passes. Fritha frowned. Forgive me, but we have been in the wilds for many days now, of what troubles do you speak? The men looked bewildered. You truly don't know? Saradush is under siege. Some army has attacked it, trying to get to the Balspawn hiding within, the leader of the brigands is said to be a giant of that same cursed heritage. The so far silent guard was nodding in grave agreement. The Balspawn within hunted by the Balspawn without, a war between the Balspawn, and we ain't opening the gates until it's all over one way or another. Solafane could see the consternation on her face. Fritha another world away as she mouthed his words again. A war between the Balspawn. Fritha. Wait here, she murmured, all at once back with them as she threw on a friendly smile for the guards. I understand your concerns, friends, but please hear me out, she pressed, her hands held out at her sides and away from her weapon as she approached drawing the pair off to one side and Solafane was sure he saw a small purse pass in the handshake that concluded their talk. One of the men stepped forward to pound on the gate and suddenly it was being drawn back and their small group slipped through to find themselves on a wide gravel street that fell away to mud near the edges, the potholes now rippling puddles, that main avenue dividing off into many smaller lanes that looked to be rivers by now, the whole town a drab sprawl of stone and mud under the murky sky. There's an inn in the center of town, called one of the guards after them. This is no town, it is a hovel, muttered Orville, though he did in his own tongue and Fritha ignored him anyway as she called back her thanks and they set out. Elves were clearly a rarity in those parts, though Fritha had the distinct impression that any party of well-armed mercenaries would likely treated with the same wary distrust, children and many people old enough to know better staring as they passed. Fritha tried to keep the friendly smile in place as they passed the barracks and she felt more than one pair of eyes rake up and down her cloaked form, and though the woman had not noticed it, Vazela was getting the same looks. Get back to the wieldeth, you dirt eaters! shouted some brave fool from the smithy, though nothing else was thrown at them as they moved through the streets and they found the inn easily enough, indeed, it would have been hard to miss the tall stone building on the corner of the empty market square and a story higher than the surrounding houses. They halted in the narrow lane next to it, Cephas already hissing his bile. The human filth, that they even dare speak to us! Fritha snorted tersely. I don't know what you're getting so outraged about, you hate Solafane because he is drow and me because I'm ginger. She sighed glad to be off the main street for all her bravado, right, stay here, I will go and get us rooms. Will they let us in? asked Bryn, the young lad clearly unused to such hostility. Fritha sent him what she hoped was a reassuring smile. Of course they will, don't worry, I won't be long. The tavern was quiet at that time of the afternoon the few patrons watching her weave her way over to the long bar that was set along the back wall, the counter curving around to leave passage to the stairs, the floor strewed with rushes to soak up the rain water and split ale both. The innkeep was standing behind the bar, the thin and balding man greeting her with the first smile she had yet to pay for as the scattering of men went back to their drinks. Well, miss, I ain't seen you around Sarah before. I am Jebet the owner here, what can I do for you? Well met, there, sir. My friends and I wish to spend the night here at your inn. Well, of course, he welcomed jovially, you got through the gates, so I have no worries there, where are they then? 
Fritha dipped her head in reluctant admission, you could take the girl from the theatre. That's the thing, we are a little unsure of our welcome. I'm part of an elven war band come down from the Wildeth. The man's face sagged. Ah, I see. Now, no offense, miss, I've nothing against your sort, or even Merck's. He assured her hastily and Fritha noticed the change in her own affiliation, but things have been tense here ever since we heard of the siege, the slightest thing is bound to put people over the edge and I do not need the trouble. But Fritha had been expecting this. Come, friend, she pleaded, in that voice of gentle insistence that would usually get her own way back in the keep, I could have lied to you and coin could have changed hands before I even mentioned this but I tried to be fair by you. We don't want any trouble either, but some of our number have been wounded and we really need somewhere safe to spend the night and tend them. Here, I've skill enough with a loot, too. She added cheerfully, I could play a few songs this evening, perhaps lighten some hearts and help you lighten some purses. The man was frowning, but Fritha could see the coin being weighed up behind his eyes and, at last, he nodded. Well all right, I've the four rooms on the top floor empty. That should do for you, though some may have to take the floor. She proffered him a small, cold hand to shake. My thanks, sir. He nodded once, turning to shout for a maid, Fritha tripping quickly back to the door to beckon the others inside, Vazela first with Avalar, the groaning gesturin still slung between them. Oh, blessed Corellan, it will not be long now, my love. Indeed, agreed Avalar, glancing back to check on the man leaning heavily on Tandith, and how is Vestal bearing up? I, I am fine, Avalar, he croaked weakly. The patrons were back to gawping at them, the innkeep watching them warily from behind the bar. Fritha for once glad they were not deigning to speak common as Orville's gaze travelled about him with an undisguised revulsion. It reeks like a fetid barn in here, I would not keep my horse in such a place. Go and ask for a stable then, if you think you will be any better off, snapped Tandith. Fritha left them to their squabble, purse in hand and moving back to the bar before the innkeep changed his mind. Right, miss, that's fifteen, Jebit's eyes caught on something behind her, and Fritha's stomach dropped with his voice, what in the nine hells? You can't bring one of them in here. One of? She repeated innocently, making a show of turning about to send a glance over to Solafane, the man as far back into his cloak as he could be, one dark hand clasping it closed at the neck. What is wrong? You said the elves could stay, he's an elf. He's a drow, the man hissed as though scared even saying the word would cause Solafane to throw back his cloak and come leaping over the bar to murder him. Fritha merely shrugged. So? Drow, sun elf, wood elf. We shook on this. She reminded firmly, her manner more placating as she continued, It will be fine, I promise. We just want a place to stay the night, then we'll be on our way. The innkeep just shook his head, laying the keys on the counter and sweeping her coin into his hand. Joaquin's golden hide, I must be every sort of fool. Back at the others, Sun and Wood were still at war. I cannot believe we are to stay the night here. You would rather stay outside the city with those rotten mercenaries wandering about. Silence, both of you barked Fern Nil, his eyes snapping back to Fritha as she arrived behind them. Where are our rooms? We've the top floor, here are the keys. Keep one, he ordered, very careful not to touch her as he took the three remaining ones. You share with the drow. Tandeth distribute the rest, I want everyone upstairs now. Their room was small and barring a rather persistent spider who had been weaving its webs all along the high rafters, quite clean, 
cellophane taking the bed against the wall while she took the one nearer the door, the cheerful yellow quilts making the world beyond the rain-spattered glass look all the more miserable. Fritha moved to the small, battered dresser, the spotted mirror showing a thin, sickly girl who looked about two days past do a good bath. And in a couple of hours, she would have everyone downstairs in the tavern looking at her thinking the same, Jebit was not the only fool in that place. In the reflection, she watched Solafane ease off his boots and lie back on his bed, eyes tracing along the cobweb festoons above. The innkeep did not wish to let a room to me, did he? Fritha shrugged, removing her hairpins to shake out the mane of damp curls. He did not want to let a room to any of us, but he did, and here we are. I hope Jestrin and Vestal are going to be all right. Avalar will see them healed. You should have him look at your arm before. A knock at their door cut him off, Fritha opening it on a swarthy young maid, a cauldron hanging from one hand and a tray of bowls and bread resting against the opposite hip, the girl clearly trying to peer past her for a glimpse of the inn's more infamous guest. Fritha smiled. Hello there. The girl's attention flicked reluctantly back to her. If you please, miss, Master Jebet sent me up with the evening's meal, he thought you would wish to eat in your rooms. Fritha's smile broadened. Did he now? Well, that is very thoughtful of him. Here, let me take that. She offered, lifting the heavy pot from her hand the girl getting her wish as Sola Fane came to take her tray. And a copper for your trouble, Petal, oh, and could you bring me a tall pitcher of water? I would wash my hair. The girl answered her request with a neat curtsy and was hurrying back down the stairs likely to share her gossip with her fellow maids. Fritha set the soup and breads down in the corridor, knocking on each door and the elves came out to serve themselves, some eating there together on the landing. Avalar coming out not long afterwards to announce both Jestrin and Vestal were sleeping peacefully and should be well enough to travel by the morrow. Fritha was as glad to hear this news as anyone, though she did not have the time to celebrate it with them, the girl leaving the elves to their talk as the maid arrived with her water and Solafane stayed pointedly out of the room as she stepped behind the screen to strip and wash both hair and body as best she could leaned over the small washstand. She was seated at the dresser in her last clean tunic when he finally ventured back, the dark red linen giving her a slightly healthier coloring, Solafane taking a seat upon his bed and watching with an undisguised curiosity as she put in her small pearl earrings and swept a soft sable powder brush over each cheek. You are going somewhere this evening. Downstairs, she sighed in tired confession. I promised Jebet I would play in the tavern in exchange for his letting us stay, and by Milo I wish I hadn't had to. My last audience was a group of pirates, and the loss of your soul and about a quarter of rum does wonders for your courage, or at least your utter indifference. Indifference, it is a feeling that is becoming more difficult to come by. This talk of war worries you, does it not? Yes. A war of the Balspawn. In my dream, Saravak told me the time of the prophesies was coming to pass, I had hoped it would all take a bit longer to get rolling, but... She trailed off, nothing more to say, and now was not the time for tears, she had just finished her coal. Solafane watched her stoop to unpack her loot, the hollow silence between them hardly lifted as she checked the tuning the girl finally letting it rest in her lap with a disconsolate sigh. I feel I should be doing something, something there at that city. I mean, it all seems a little pointless carrying on to the mountains when our quarry has clearly broken cover and struck elsewhere. Perhaps I should speak to Fern Nil, they may attack Sultana Cellar. Solafane felt a swell of unnamed panic and he was suddenly... Desperately aware he would do anything to keep her from that doomed city. Consider though, Fritha, what can we few do against an army? And will not this country send its own soldiers to protect the city in time? The girl sighed again, 
the knot in his stomach loosening as she nodded. You are right, of course. Ah, I had better get this over with, you are coming down, as well. She questioned as he bent to pull on his boots. Yes. This place is not a friendly one, the men look at you like. The females used to look at you, Fritha laughed. He nodded gravely, unable to share her amusement. Indeed, and I do not think that anywhere that can draw comparisons with my former home is a good place, I would not have you go down alone. This place is all right, I've been in worse in my time. That is hardly a reassurance. I will wear my cloak. He offered, but she shook her head. No, don't, you'll only draw even more eyes if you do, but any trouble and I promised the innkeep we'd retire to our rooms. I understand. The tavern was much busier than when they had last left it a sickly fog of pipe smoke hanging over the crowded tables and mingling with the reek of stale beer, the gruff shouts and laughter assaulting his ears similarly, clumsy men and their shrill, florid wives all drowning the end of another day, Sola feigned sobering as he suddenly realized that such was likely how Ferdinil saw them, too. Fritha was talking to the innkeep and Sola Fane lingered there at the bar in the shadow of the stairs, watching Jebit nod to the far corner where a bread pallet and collection of boards made a makeshift stage. A certain lull seemed to descend as Fritha approached it, a murmur of snickering breaking the spell as the girl tripped over the uneven boards to stumble onto the stage, her face scarlet and set with a very fixed smile as she finally faced her audience. Right, well, good master Jebit has asked me to play for you all, but with only me and my loot, I might need some help. We can see that, pedal, boomed a deep voice. The room laughed, Fritha joining it though Sola Fane fancied it looked forced, the noise dying as she opened with the first chord of a song he had heard her sing a few times when at her chores in camp, the lute's sprightly accompaniment lending the lyrics of a mate and her departing soldier a more cheerful air, though he felt he was perhaps in the minority of those appreciating it. Sola Fane turned away going back to nursing the strong sour ale he had ordered, his eyes catching on the far side of the bar and a familiar blonde head. He and Fritha were not the only ones of their company down there, it seemed, Fernil and Tandeth sat at a table, a stucky, bearded human opposite them who wore his leather armor with the comfortable air of one who rarely removed it. The drow watched them a while, one song blending into another and then a third, with hardly a smattering of applause between, before a handshake confirmed the deal though he noted it was only Tandeth who offered his hand. The human returned to his ale as the two elves rose and headed back to the stairs, the wood elf noticing him there and giving a polite nod to his captain as he crossed to join him. Sola Fane, cousin, you take great risk being down here, though I can perhaps understand it, he added, with a glance to where Fritha was still struggling to win over her audience, Sola Fane turned back to the bar before his displeasure could grow. You have found a guide. Tandeth nodded. Yes, and not only does he know well these mountains, but he knows also of a strange temple up there, newly built and on a scale too great for any man. A temple? Built by the giants, I assume, but to what purpose? To the long dead ball perhaps? Offered the elf with a shrug. I know there are many of his cult who would see him resurrected. Did not Fritha share with you some clue? And why would she know of this? Solafane demanded hotly, she is not as they. Peace, cousin, Tandeth soothed, I meant no offense, only that she may have some past knowledge of this that we do not, another piece to the puzzle, as it were. Solafane felt the shame surface quickly. After a ten day of mistrust, he was beginning to anticipate it. I am sorry, Tandeth. And no, I have not asked her of this. Though Fritha speaks of acceptance, I believe her heritage distresses her, she was upset enough to hear of Sarah Dush. 
the wood elf was nodding his sympathy. Understandable. As for this temple, we will know soon enough, the human, Ivek, has agreed to lead us there on the morrow. This will please Fritha, said Sola Fane, feeling his own relief swell, too. She was worried that our journey to the mountains would prove fruitless now this siege has begun. Tandith smiled. Then I am glad to give you the news, cousin. Well, I leave you to your watch. He nodded once, standing to take his leave and Sola Fane turned back to the room. It seemed Fritha's first few songs had been enough to convince her that her own tastes were not attuned to the crowds, the girl gamely opening up the floor to suggestions, her audience growing only bodier as the ale flowed. Right there, any other requests? I, lass, get em out. Fritha laughed along with the rest of the rabble, Sola Fane could tell she was not remotely amused. I don't think I know that one, mate, hum the first few bars and I'll see if it comes to me. Any others? Sing my fat cockerel. A tight smile, the first few notes being plucked by stiff fingers as Fritha drew a breath to begin that song of a stout bird that rose each morning and had visits from many a farmer's daughter, and Sola Fane knew it was vulgar even if he could not understand how, the crowd were enjoying it, if nothing else. The man felt a scowl furrow his brow, and he was not alone in his displeasure. Ferdinil and Tandith were not the only elves to have ventured down to the tavern, though their reasons likely differed from the two who were propping up the other side of the bar. Cephas and Orville had clearly decided it was far more enjoyable and, not to say, easy picking fault with the humans whilst stood amongst them, the young men held wrapped by the surrounding lewdness. Though their moral superiority seemed to have slipped a bit itself, the two clearly having imbibed more of that strong ale that they should, Sola Fane watching as they finally noticed him to share a smile that could only mean trouble, and move along the bar to join him. So you are here enjoying the entertainment with the rest of this ilk, Cephas sneered, this must be quite the novelty for you, seeing a woman debased instead of you males. Sola Fane felt his lips curl back in a snarl. She does this for your bed, so be silent. Corellan, this place is a pit, scoffed Orville, fine eyes scanning the ale-soaked rabble, I went outside to take some air and there was a man passing water in the street. The humans are no better than animals, in some cases, they are worse. You seem to like their ale well enough. These dregs? I thought it safer than drinking the water. His brother was nodding his agreement, his attention drifting to where Fritha was stood in the corner, singing as though she wanted nothing more, her voice barely audible over those bellowing along with her. Cephas snorted his contempt. At least you drow have a certain standard, and as for our half-human, she may have been playing at the manners and charm with us but I see it did not take her long to revert to the ways of her own kind once she was back with them. In his chest, that coiled snake of anger was rearing back. You think she takes pleasure in this? Cephas smiled. You tell us, Drow, you would know better than we how she takes her pleasure. I do not like your tone, Elf. No. I am not surprised, you obviously favor a harsher timber, the barked orders of your ball whore, for one. His shriek was lost in the applause, that sharp sneering face slammed instantly into the counter, Orville too surprised to react, and he was not given the chance, Fritha suddenly behind them and looking furious. When I promised the innkeep no trouble I did not think I would have to watch for it within my own group. You too. She snapped to the elves, Cephas glowering at her from above a bleeding lip, Get upstairs before I get the captain down here to fetch you. Sola Fane. Do not, he forestalled dully, more annoyed at himself than he had been with any of the elves yet, I know what you will say. She sighed and shook her head. 
What made you finally lose temper with them? Cephas called you a whore. Fritha looked more surprised than angry. What, really? That arse. Next time I'm on to cook, I'm going to spit in his food. They believe we are lovers, Solafane added reluctantly, though this insult was greeted with an unexpected amusement, the girl laughing behind her hand. Really? We've certainly perfected the art of doing it quietly then, haven't we? Solafane was bewildered. Does it not anger you? Not particularly, she shrugged, though I suppose it is not quite the same compliment for you. Just, please, Solafane, no more trouble. Jebit was sending them a pointed frown from the other side of the counter and Fritha sighed. A deal is a deal, I had best get back to it. Honestly, Solafane, this cannot be any fun for you. Just retire, I will be fine. I am not. Solafane, please, she pressed quietly, this is embarrassing enough. I don't want you here listening to me as I sing about farmer's fat, silly daughters and making hilariously veiled references to copulation. He dipped his face, too tired to argue. As you wish it. Solafane turned to go, the drunk who had been lurching towards the bar staggering into him. Here, watch it, you, he slurred, blinking down at him through bleary eyes, you're that drow, ain't you? Yeah, I heard one of you was here, murderous dog. What are you looking at, huh? I bet you think we're all afraid of you, don't you? Well, I ain't, I'll cut you from chuff to chin. For one blistering instant, Solafane could have murdered him where he stood. Fritha's smile hid a clenched jaw. Can I have a word with you? Why, oh course. What's the ah? The man cried, as she locked a hand about his arm and pushed him deeper into the shadow of the stairs, words hissed through her teeth like an innate lizard. Are you mad or just a fool? You think your sword will even leave the scabbard before you are screaming at his feet, sobbing into the bleeding stump where your hand had once been? No, so sit down and shut up. She left the man there, staring rather dazed at her back as she returned to him. Solafane, I'm sorry. I should go, he interrupted tersely, I am just causing trouble here. Solafane. He ignored her, the anger making it difficult to do anything other than march onward up those stairs, the roars and laughter drifting after him as Fritha once more took to the stage. It was nearly two hours later when she finally returned to their room. Solafane had been on the bed, laying fully clothed on top of it, an arm over his eyes though he had jerked upright at her entrance the pair exchanging a wordless nod as Fritha slipped behind the screen to change. She was in bed now, sat up and massaging oil into her stiff fingers, Solafane stalking about the room as he changed as well, throwing off his gear with a directionless anger that somehow managed to penetrate her tiredness in the hollow, slightly shamed feeling an evening of lewd catcalls had left her with, to make her feel all the worse. No prayers tonight. She murmured as the man pulled the curtain across the window, the moon already hidden similarly behind a veil of clouds. No, he spat bitterly, hauling off his tunic to throw it at the foot of his bed, my heart is full of anger, I will not taint my worship with it. He sank onto the sagging mattress with a terse sigh. I hate it here. Well, it is just for the night. And what will that matter? He burst out suddenly, it will be the same everywhere I go. I left the Underdark to become a free man, liberated of the constraints that place put upon me, but how can I when I am just as trapped here by others' prejudice? At least among the drow, people will not challenge you without some reason, here, they just look upon my face. Yes, 
there are places such as Redm store, where they will judge as they find, but we both know that my acceptance there was due to you. And even your good nature is lost in places such as this, towns built of stone and distrust, and filled with men who would murder me merely for the pride of saying they had. What am I to do, then? Find some remote village that will have me and settle down there? I am a warrior, not a farmer, and I wish only to live freely, but how can I hear? Fritha dipped her face, feeling like she could cry had she had the energy for it. I know, I am sorry. And that is it. He cried, closing the gap between them in two strides to sit at her side. I do not desire your apology, Fritha, you have done nothing wrong, but how can you stand it? I see how you must act, you wear your charm as I do my cloak, every allowance we receive not given freely but hard-earned by you with smiles and bribes. Why this acceptance? The elves treat you like filth and the humans here are no better. Why are you not angry? Fritha drew a breath, feeling the misery and frustration she had been trying for so long to ignore rising to burst forth in a shrill cry. Because this is it for me, Solafane. The Ballspawn are at war and I can't imagine it will be long before all the children are dragged into it, and what the Cephas or Sira or the whole of Sodding Seller thinks of me is so far down the list of my current concerns, it's falling off the bottom. It upsets you, does it not? Your heritage, what it means for you. Of course, it does. She cried desperately, the man's eyes suddenly alive. Then come with me. There are places in this world where they have not heard of Drow or even Ball. We can go away, far from here until this war, this whole cursed place is long behind us. Solafane, I can't. Why? Do you want to accept your destiny, even if means your death? You would die for people who call you a whore and treat you no better. I know you feel that to try and forge a life here is but a pointless endeavor, that death will always stalk you, but I swear, join me and I will take you far enough that even your heritage will not catch you. She stared back at him, the eyes that refused to leave hers and in her heart she felt it spark, that last glimmer of hope. I must continue with the elves for now. Once we have discovered the threat to the Wieldeth and Saradush both, then, then, I will think about it. He nodded once, patting her arm as he rose, and perhaps her promise calmed him enough, for she fell asleep to the quiet murmur of his prayers. End of chapter